Hey y'all, welcome to Parker's Reef. On today's episode, we're gonna do the three year review of my dream reef tank. All right guys, thank you for joining me on another episode of Parker's Reef. I am here, it's been a little while since I've done a video on my dream reef tank, but uh, I was looking at the calendar and it is basically, I mean, I might be a couple of weeks early, but it's basically the three year anniversary for my tank. And uh, whilst I haven't been doing a lot to it of late, unlike at the start when I had a video out pretty much every week of a new pump, new wave maker, new light, new fish, new coral, once you hit that three year mark, things tend to stabilize a little bit. However, it's been six months since I've done a video on the Dream Reef Tank and there has been quite a bit that I can cover. So we're here today with a three year review of the Dream Reef Tank. Now, before I jump too far into things, I want to give a huge shout out to Nick from Nick's Aquarium, the logo right here. The man has printed out some shirts. I hope you can see the new Parker's Reef logo on the back of my shirt there. I put a little bit of effort in and had a brand new logo for the channel created, and I think it looks really, really cool. It features my standout or my showpiece fish in Prius, the hybrid angel. He's right here on cue right now, and um, he just looks really cool, sort of cartoonized there. And uh, Nick was generous enough to uh, just as a uh, as a congratulations or a thank you and um, he, he created these shirts for me and also created a few extras so I've got a handful of these shirts I'll give out to some uh, regulars that I see down at Deer Park Aquarium and some guys that I know follow the channel I've got a couple of shirts a couple of different sizes so Please don't despair if you don't get one. It's nothing personal. I don't have hundreds of these, but I do plan on getting some merchandise made with that new logo, as well as getting it animated and maybe creating a new intro for the channel, which would be really, really cool. And I'd love to hear your feedback on what you'd like to see animated on that uh, logo. I'm thinking something about Prius swimming in, maybe biting a coral and then the coral disappearing and Parker's Reef coming around the outside of him just to make the logo set. But um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But again, huge shout out to Nick for making these shirts and also providing a couple the corals in this tank that we'll get to a little bit later. Now, I did say in the intro that not a lot has happened to the Dream Roof tank, and that's probably a little bit of a white lie. There was four main topics we'll cover today. First and foremost, as you can probably see, is the coral growth in this tank. I'll go into in-depth coverage of the corals and how they've grown and um, some of the issues potentially that's caused and also some of the joys because I guess ultimately that is the game. We're here to uh, try and get fish going healthy, living peacefully, and obviously corals growing out and giving that really nice color and just making it go from a fish tank to a piece of the reef is what I was really aiming for with this tank. So we'll cover all the coral growth in the first section. Second section is one that I've probably struggled a little bit more with than I would have liked, and that's covering some of the fish challenges I've had with this tank over the last six months. I'm not immune to going through all of the highs and lows that we all go through with our reef tanks. And uh, some of the lows have definitely been fish wise on this system, probably from day one, but also over the last six months, I've just tried to push the envelope a little bit more and uh, ultimately it's come and bit me in the behind. So we'll go over all of the fish challenges and updates and changes there in section two. Section three is a topic that people are always interested in and that's probably because I am a bit of a gadget freak and that's going over all of the equipment primarily down below in the uh, sump system there. You might notice I've taken the doors off today so we can get in nice and close, go over everything that's happening in the sump there and give you a good update as to how things are going, what might change in future and um, any sort of challenges I've had there. And then last but not least in section four will be what is the future plans for the Dream Reef Tank. Obviously it is at the three year mark, so it's not gonna be turning it upside down and changing absolutely everything on the tank, but I do have a couple of subtle things that I wanna change on this tank just to keep its momentum going into the next few years. I gotta say the tank is three years old and I personally think it looks incredible, but I wanna stay on top of things so that it does continue to look incredible for the next seven to 10 to 12 years, which was my expected lifespan for the Dream Reef Tank. Now, just before we do jump into things, I did just want to say that after the initial premiere of this video, I will put chapter marks in for each one of those four topics. So you can skip straight to the chapter that you want to see and go from there. But for everyone else, sit back and enjoy the show. All right, let's kick things off with probably the most exciting thing that's been happening in this tank, and that is the exponential coral growth. I will in a second get the DSLR and we'll have a look from the top down as well as from the front of the tank, just so I can show you all of the colors and all of the growth this tank is going through. 
I've got to say it has really taken off over the last six months. I did have really good growth, I think, for the first 12 months, much, much more than I expected this tank to get. And then I had a couple of issues with the iodine and some other things. And whilst I wouldn't say things stagnated, it definitely just kicked back a gear and just kind of went into cruise control. I'm pleased to say that's not the case anymore. The tank is growing ridiculously quickly to the point now where I am getting out and about. In fact, you saw recently I went up to Atlas Aquariums in Brisbane, also went up to uh, Brisbane to the Reeftopia grand opening and to check out Nick's Aquarium. And a couple of other times I've been out and about with work and things like that. When I leave this tank for two or three days and I come back, I can instantly tell the coral growth. Some super visual things that make it very, very obvious to see is my red Monty cap over there. Every time I clean the glass, I go past with the magnet cleaner and I take probably somewhere between 15 and 20 decent sized frags off it just by uh, moving the uh, magnet cleaner past it and it just instantly frags itself from there. But other things that I notice when I'm uh, just checking in on coral health and then I notice the coral next to it has just doubled or tripled in size and it's completely shaded it or just covered it. Of course, there have been some challenges with that as well. Obviously, when some corals grow very, very fast, the ones next to it can either be smothered, they can be uh, outcompeted for resourcing in either light or flow and ultimately suffer or even die off in some cases. Now, I've always been one where I don't like to interfere too much. That being said, if it's a prized coral that's getting shaded over or more so if it's a coral that I'm not that fond of that's doing the, gra the, the really fast growing, that's when I will break things back. Otherwise, I do tend to let things go. And there are a couple of instances over here where the Monty Cap just grew around a blue stag and things like that. And ultimately the blue stag didn't like it too much, but I tend to just let things go because it does give some interesting natural growth patterns. And ultimately it means you're gonna end up with a tank full of corals that are super hardy and uh, are growing as well as they can in this system. And it tends to work well for me. It does come at some cost, and there are a couple of pieces in here now that um, yeah, have ultimately paid the price, but uh, they don't stand out. I've got that much color and growth in there that uh, the couple of pieces that are passing are not super obvious. And uh, I guess the silver lining to that cloud is it does give me the opportunity to put new pieces on the skeletons that died off. And uh, if you have a look up this end here, this is kind of my uh, coral acclimation area where I put new pieces in the system just so they get used to the light because uh, as you can see from the lights on this tank, I run quite a bit of pass. So sometimes when I put new pieces in, particularly if I mount them up high, they do tend to go through a little bit of a shock. So this is where I sit my new pieces. And um, I've got to say this uh, wild SPS colony that I picked up from Deer Park Aquarium, I should say at the moment, David Deer Park got a ridiculously cool wild SPS order in this week. This is not a piece from it. I'm yet to get up there, but uh, the day that this video goes live, I will be in store and um, Maybe by the end of that day, there'll be a couple more pieces sitting down here in the acclimation area. But uh, back to the topic, this piece here and a couple of other pieces down here have actually started to encrust onto the glass in the bottom of the tank. So I'd have to say for our wild SPS to encrust onto the glass, I'm obviously getting a decent amount of power and I'm obviously parameters are pretty good. What I will do now though, is I'll grab the DSLR, we'll go into the top of the tank and have a good look from the top down because any real reefer out there knows that is where you see the best colors from your corals and also get a really cool perspective of the growth. So I'll grab in a uh, chair, we'll stand on that, I'll get the DSLR down and we'll have a good look at these corals from there. All right, we may as well start over here on the right-hand side at the front where my hammer garden is. They're all going quite well in there. They're fairly smooshed in now as they've uh, grown out a little bit, but the contrasting colors are working well and uh, the big showpiece of the gold hammer that you'll see in a second is still doing really, really well. See that really nice uh, sort of yellow lined piece just sitting down there on the sand kind of at the back of this bommie. So it doesn't get seen a lot, but it is quite a special piece. And I really love this uh, very fine uh, branched uh, reverse there. It's really, really special and contrasts really nicely with that uh, true showpiece gold hammer. This is under a fairly white spectrum. I apologize for the sort of shakiness. I haven't uh, turned the flow off at all because I like to show you the uh, corals uh, in their uh, moving state. And uh, you can see some nice hammers along the front there. That toxic green down the bottom is really nice. And you can see the one there that's really stretching out has caused me a little bit of trouble, has stung a few pieces as well as itself, strangely. But um, that has opened up a couple of spaces there despite a little bit of bubble algae about there for me to put a couple of 
of new hammers in. I've even got a gold torch over on the right-hand side there that despite getting probably a little bit too much flow there on the leading edge, is doing really, really well and has actually grown back from near death. Now, this is the red cap that I was talking about, and it's only really from the top when the camera focuses that you can see just how big this thing is. It, uh, it is taking up a fair amount of real estate in the tank, but it's such an iconic piece, and it does have that uh, other multi-cap next to it, which we'll talk about in a second. Down here, you've got the, that uh, blue stag that it strangled. There's also a nice, uh, I think it's a tutti fruity uh, acro in there, which is really, really special. This piece here, just to the left of the uh, multi-cap, unfortunately copped it from all angles and uh it hasn't died but it's all but dead i do really love the uh, true green goblin next to it there though that's got uh, some really really bright colors as well as this super hairy wa blue stag that uh really do contrast the colors of the red cap really nicely there's some other nice pieces in there um oh i can't go past that green goblin though but uh, we've got this uh, interesting little uh strawberry shortcake-esque uh, acro next to it got a uh, basic green pokey down there in the back doing everything this really cool smooth skin purple i like it does give a nice little pop of color there and then this piece that has grown really fast is this grafted sunfire cap you can see it's got the red and green one piece with a nice light green or yellow polyp and uh, you can see well it's hard to see from there but it has actually grown up onto the back wall and uh, starting the cap around now so it's a pretty cool looking piece if i do say so myself come back past a uh, strawberry shortcake there that i got from al at uh, Lifestyle Aquariums. And then uh, here we've got a cherry bomb that for some reason has always had uh, like burnt tips on the top, but the rest of it's super furry. Got a nice goni in there just stinging this uh, really cool smooth skin acro that I'll probably need to move into a better spot. Uh, nice bright banana pora getting some good extension there. You can see no shortage of bubble algae around this tank. I am due to do a treatment again on it, but uh, so far it hasn't really caused me any trouble. So I don't want to be too quick to act. You can see plenty of uh, red forest fire digi around here. I put this in basically basically to break up this huge blue and green stag or stag-like piece behind it because uh, it's it's really quite a large piece in the tank and um, I have touched on before how I've got too much blue in the tank so I put some red uh, digi in there and that's doing the job well. Down there on the base I've got uh, some uh, fireworks with a uh, cherry tree monty I think it is kind of strangling it. Got a nice candy cane in there. Here's my smooth skin blue that uh, did cop a little bit of uh, detritus and cyano at some stage but it continues to grow in all directions. There is a piece there that did cop uh, just a little bit too much growth from others all around it. It was a nice, a really dark black cherry sort of colored piece. In here, I've got uh, the lovely uh, red Monty that uh, is, is different from anything else I've seen. And then I've got that red dragon there, which is really taking off. And then if we come across to the right a little bit, you'll see, I'll well, just have a quick look at that Monty that this is the worst angle to view this Monty from because it's actually really a vertical piece, but uh, it's growing through there and it's having a good arm wrestle with this uh, Dustin's cousin, I'm pretty sure it is, this blue and green piece that uh, actually looks a lot more green in low light, but uh, up here we're right under a bunch of lights, so it goes fairly blue, but uh, it grows like no tomorrow. Anyone chasing pieces of this, let me know. I can uh, get frags for days of this because um, it's pretty much single-handedly to blame for chewing up all of my <laughs> dosing and calcium reactor and calcosa. It just chews it up and grows right before your eyes. Back here, you can't see this from the front of the tank, but this really interesting green piece there. I've got um, got a couple of different sort of uh, green goblins up here. These ones are a little less bright or maybe just getting too much light. Nice purple and green piece back there that I'm waiting for it to grow out. Here's the original SPS I put in the system, this deep, uh, really really coarse or very uh, tight growth pattern uh, blue which still continues to armor us with all of these other pieces here. This is what becoming one of my favorites in here, this tabling pink acro. It's uh, just defied all odds. It put it in as just one little nub of that on a point of a rock and it's grown out, made space for this table and uh, just have a look how pretty that is. I really like it. In next to it's this really cool uh, orange sort of colored Millie. And then up in this pretty much primo real estate position is this wild acropora that I picked up that um, it just hasn't quite delivered on its color yet you can see these bright yellow tips on it that uh, when it first came in it was just crazy nice colored now it has sort of 
beiged out a little bit in the tank, but I keep giving it time because um, I know it'll be a showpiece if it does color up. I've got some random pieces all fighting in here for real estate, some sort of Robuster-esque pieces, that uh, nice purple and green. Uh, I've got that uh, thick branching uh, ready maroni colored piece there, really nice uh, yellow wild caught piece there. Uh, back here, I've got a little bit more of that uh, cherry tree Monty Ward. I'm not sure if it's cherry tree, but let's call it that. Uh, some sort of average colored uh, millies there, some more blue stags, some uh, local uh, green digi, a nice, uh, very solid green or a strange colored green uh, acro there. Some more of this, uh, what I'm calling Dustin's cousin. I, I don't know what it's called, but um, it is what it is. I got a bit of TNT there, which has copped a little bit of abuse from uh, Aptasia, bubble algae and cyano, but it continues on. Got a Lobo there in highlight, just uh, doing fine. Nice green torch there. And then we come around into the uh, sea of blue digi, or we might try and scoot around that. You see down on the sand there, got a uh, pretty standard goni, but uh, my clownfish loves it. So um, that can stay there. I'm cool with that. And then uh, there's this really nice cherry colored piece there. I'm really hoping that grows out more because the color on that's super, super addictive. In front of that's a little uh, petrol slick frag, I'm pretty sure it is. And then I've got a couple of uh, random green pieces there, including that super bright creek green piece that I got from ARC Aquariums. Got a little bit more of some fireworks there. A red goni that uh, the other clownfish is enjoying. A nice a highlighter yellow acro there. Uh, down on the base, there's actually a uh, bower banky there. Um, it's kind of hard to see from the top because uh, we're now entering the uh, sea of blue digi and uh, just waiting for the camera to focus on that because there's no shortage of this stuff. And I gotta say, particularly when my calcium dropped, like I mentioned before, uh, it it got very brittle. Um, it, uh, it, I mean, blue digi always breaks off quite easily, but uh, when that calcium drops, it got very, very brittle. So uh, it's it's doing just fine. I've got some uh, red digi here, but it's kind of hard to see that from the front of the tank. You can see from the back, got a little bit more red dragon there. There's actually some pink digi in there. The color doesn't look great there, probably because it's getting smothered, but... Um, yeah, in hindsight, the the blue digi, uh, it's a cool piece, but uh, it is pretty invasive. Um, we come up here, we go past some red dragon, we've got some more blue stag that continues to just grow in weird directions. It does crop quite a lot of flow and light up there, so that may have something to do with it, but um, it's, it's different nonetheless. And um, it does at times have really nice color. In uh, behind here, when the camera focuses in on it, I've got a little piece of growing red polyp uh, Dallas, which uh, if you remember my previous display tank, Dallas Acropora was uh, its kind of uh, calling card. Got another little frag there of the uh, sun uh, fire grafted cap. And then back here is a really cool Monty that um, I'm just trying to focus on that I got from uh, Nick's Aquarium. It's another red Monty cap. This one's got purple bleeding through it. So this has just come in the mail the last few days. So it's, uh, it's still settling in, but uh, I've seen it in Nick's display tank and the purple on that's really vibrant. And uh, what I mentioned that I uh, wouldn't mind a piece of that. My good man, Nick sent me one down. So that's pretty cool. Got some cool frags down there. Nice uh, beach bum Monty, I think that is in there. Uh, and then we come around here. This is where my uh, really cool blue acro was that a lot of people loved, but uh, the red dragons kind of just smothered that out of contention. You got this uh, green Aspera, I think it is there. And then we come across to, of course, the Walt Disney, which um, I must say it's not growing super, super quick anymore, but it does still look really cool. It's got nice color, nice polyp extension. You see a couple of little uh, bits there where it's been fragged and a little bit of cyano or something sort of settles on it. I've got to just keep blowing that off, but uh, all in all, it's doing cool. And then down in front here are some pieces that have struggled a little. They have suffered some uh, Aptasia early on before the uh, stripies and stuff cleaned that out, but uh, still a little bit of bubble algae and things in there, but uh, they continue to thrive and uh, do their thing. Branch out like this one, it kind of died right back, but grew out to find and get a little bit of light and flow. But all in all the pieces, it's a little bit of a... Um, a little bit of a Hunger game situation. You can see these frags down the bottom here just settling in, but uh, all in all, they're doing quite well. All right, on to section two of the three-year update of my Dream Reef tank. And this one is a little less joyous. We talked about the coral growth in section one and how good that's been with a couple of sort of downsides, I guess, in that when coral grows really quick, the one next to it may struggle a little bit. But uh, fish is something that I have really had some challenges with on this system of late. And I'm super glad to say at the moment, that uh, the biggest stress for my tank over the last couple of months has been my Atlantic blue tang, the biggest guy in the system. He's a good, this sort of size fish, decided he just did not like my uh, mustard tang anymore. And um, 
here he is here. You can see now we're all good. Mustard Tang, Atlantic Blue Tang right next to each other. No aggression whatsoever. But uh, for a good five to six weeks there, that Atlantic Blue would not stop. He chased that Mustard Tang around every square inch of the tank. Now, probably the saving grace in that situation was that my Mustard Tang is considerably smaller and considerably faster than this gigantic Atlantic Blue. So he was able to get away from him and get into spots where the Atlantic Blue could not get. Now, that did mean that he spent the last six weeks pretty much hiding in little holes all around the tank. And my Atlantic Blue had bumps and scratches and gouges all over him from very aggressively trying to get that Mustard Tang. But, um, Strangely overnight, everyone seemed to just chill out and now they swim around together. So fingers crossed I am past that stress, but it was to the point where I was thinking I was gonna to have to remove the Atlantic Blue Tang because he is the alpha fish in this tank and um, if he decides he's gonna be aggressive, it's not gonna end well for anyone. But uh, I gave it as long as I could, mainly because both fish looked okay. Despite the markings on the Atlantic Blue, uh, both fish would basically uh, put weapons down and eat at the same time. As soon as the food was finished, you'd go back to chasing him again, but both looked fine, no serious markings, no signs of a white spot from the stress. And um, they both seemed to be doing okay. It was really just a unpleasant sight to see a fish getting chased to the point where one really wanted to kill the other one constantly around the tank. But uh, so far, so good. We are past that and I'm happy to say that uh, both of those guys are now good friends and living harmoniously. Now, unfortunately for me, that is not where the fish challenges end. Over the last few months, I have lost a few fish in this system and uh, it, it hurts. Uh, it hasn't been an answer to it as far as I can tell, other than maybe some aggression. I have actually lost in that time my Lineatus Ras, uh, I, which I had as my first sort of test Ras in this system, just to get a little bit of faith back in Ras as a species, and uh, he was doing great. He was in here for a good couple of months, and then all of a sudden, he seemed to have just died out of nowhere. Now, I say out of nowhere, I did suspect I added a beautiful looking fish, a rose band ras, shortly after, probably uh, a month after adding the lineatus. And uh, the rose band are uh, normally a very peaceful fish. Mine seemed to be quite aggressive and would chase everyone around the system. Anyone that went basically up to this third of the tank, this is what he decided was his territory. And uh, my lineatus went from being a fish that would swim up and down all day, really nice, active, bright, colorful fish, to being a fish that would just hide the whole time. So. I'm gonna to have to say the rose band had stressed him to death and likewise I had a beautiful blotchy anthea that uh, I had slowly, slowly coaxed into coming out and about. When I first put him in, he lived inside the red Monty cap, wouldn't come out of there, except for feeding, he'd dart out, grab a bit of food, dart back into the red Monty cap. Over time, I got him to come out and basically hang in this section of the tank. But like I just touched on before, that one third of the tank was where the rose band had decided he was gonna own. And um, unfortunately for my blotchy Anthea, he had never left that one third of the tank. So I think the rose band had may have stressed the blotchy Anthea as well. So I lost the Liniatus, I lost the blotchy. And then in a cruel twist of fate, after all of that stress, the rose band had added, he then ended up dead. So um, sometimes it is, <laughs> Sometimes these challenges are just unexplained. There was no signs of disease. All the fish were eating. There was the stress from the rose bandit for the first two, but then uh, what caused the rose bandit to die? Anyone's guess. I think he just ran out of fish to bully, so he decided life wasn't worth living anymore. I don't know, but um, it's, it's been challenging. The last few months have really been challenging. From losing those three fish to uh, having my uh, Big Atlantic Blue deciding it was gonna start butchering everyone in the path of that mustard tang. And I say that because uh, things like my uh, my gem tang copped a decent bite on his uh, upper fin, which was healing over just fine. I don't know if he got in the way, a bit of cannon fodder, or if uh, maybe the, the Atlantic Blue mistook him for the uh, mustard tang at one point in time and bit him. I've also got a uh, marine baiter in the system who uh, did also cop a whack at one stage. And I'm assuming just from the sheer speed that these two were chasing each other. The beta does tend to be a pretty slow fish and chills in the back corner down there. And um, I suspect that in one of the uh, swoops around the system, he might've got cleaned up. But again, happy to say he is healing up just fine. And thankfully it hasn't uh, slowed down his uh, adventure in this that's a word. He's willing to uh, advance around the tank. Uh, he typically spends most of his time in this back corner, but uh, I do find him very randomly up at uh, this end of the tank or in the middle of the tank, just cruising around. And when it, it does come out, it's such a beautiful sight. I say he, we've actually named the fish Bet. Yeah, Bet because it's a beta. Uh, Bet's a beautiful fish and um, it's really 
rewarding when you see her because uh, it's not a fish you see all the time. You mainly see her once or twice a day. So um, when she comes out, she's a big fish. She's a good that long. So when she does come out, it's quite a sight. And um, I'm glad to say that despite copping that little bit of uh, friendly fire, I'll say for lack of better words, that uh, it hasn't hurt her, um, her willingness to get around the tank. So I'm hoping I'll find some wood to touch. Uh, it's all metal and plastic, but touch some wood there that um, I may be out of the woods of uh, all of my fish dramas. I have suspected my Chromis being a little bit aggressive. They do tend to go into a witching hour every night and uh, want to box on with everyone, but they really don't have any firepower and um, they do mostly tend to go at each other. But uh, I'm still a little gun shy about uh, moving forward with sort of, certainly any high end fish. I may test the waters with some, uh, just some more commonly known to be hardy fish first. I don't want to try something that's already known to be extremely finicky and uh, difficult and also expensive only for it to die. I have put a, uh, a one fish that I forgot to mention in my additions. I have put a, a court jester goby or an old glory goby in this system and uh, he's done completely fine. He cruises around, no qualms whatsoever. No one even looks at him twice. So. Um, that's a win, one fish has done well. Whether I test the waters this week, next week, next month, or maybe even next year on some new fish in this system, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe we'll touch on that in the future plans. All right, section three, and we're gonna talk about equipment on this system. And I think the best way to do that is to bring the camera in close so we can have a good look at this sump and I'll go over what's been happening in that area. All right, welcome down into the sump area of my dream reef tank. And I've got to say, whilst I'm not the best at keeping everything absolutely spotless clean, having good quality equipment down here has absolutely paid dividends. The stand looks like it did the day I put it together. The cabinetry is still perfect. All of the uh, uh, motorized hoods and motorized light frames, everything still works exactly as it did in day one, which in an environment like a, a reef tank with all of that hot, humid and salty air, it's super, super impressive. So I'm really, really happy that I did spend the extra money and the extra time in planning this system to the level to get it to where it holds up like it does here. So first and foremost, I do just want to cover that, but uh, we're probably here to talk about what's working well and not working so well from an equipment perspective. Now, I don't know if it's probably unfair to say it's not working well, but we did touch on before about the exponential coral growth that this uh, system has been going through over the last six months. And uh, one challenge that has created is the tank pH now sits quite low, mostly because my calcium reactor is flowing a lot of effluent at a very, very low pH. So I now have my set point to 6.1 pH, which Anyone that runs a calcium reactor knows that's about as low as you go before turning that media to absolute sludge. And I am running 45 mil a minute of effluent through it now. Depending on the growth, sometimes I have a look at what my KH Guardian tells me, which measures the alkalinity on the hour every hour. But when things start to go through a bit of an extra growth spurt, I can speed that up to about 60 mil a minute, which is pretty much maxing out my calcium reactor. So. <laughs> things are uh, on the tipping point there. One, just because I can't feed it any more through the calcium reactor, I'd have to go at a larger calcium reactor. I do at the moment need to make sure that I keep the media as full as possible because as soon as that uh, media in the calcium reactor drops down a little bit, I'm losing heaps and heaps of the uh, capacity of what it can dose into the system. So as long as I keep that full, I get away with it and I can keep things back to about 45 mil a minute. But as soon as it drops low, like it is at the moment, as soon as I take about an inch or two off the top of that uh, high level of the media, it does just require me to run it a bit harder. And as a result, it does drop the pH in this system. Now, I know pH has been a value that's uh, probably the buzzword around reef tanks over the last year or two. Everyone aiming for those sky high pH levels. And I've got to say, I'm not uh, immune to that. I've something I've pushed with this system to try and get as high as I can. But because of that calcium reactor running as hard as it is, my pH now sits as it currently is, is just around 7.9, 8.0, which is, not anything to uh, write home about. And that's despite the fact that I run a heap of Kalkwasser as well. In fact, Kalkwasser in the system is something that I've had to push the boundaries a little bit with just to try and get that pH up above 7.7, .7, which is where it can get down as low as if I don't push the Kalkwasser to the level where the only way I could get more Kalkwasser in this system was to put more into it than the tank was actually evaporating because as you know, you can use Kalkwasser instead of your typical RODI as top off water. 
Problem being your tank only evaporates so much each day and I needed to add even more for the extra alkalinity and calcium, but also to try and boost that pH. Now, the measures I've gone to to make that possible is through my automatic water change system, I actually bring in water that's a salinity of 1.052, so it's twice as salty as your normal salt water level. That allows me to pump out 20 liters of salt water a day and only bring in 10 liters of salt water a day. So there's a 10 liter deficit that I can then use the Kalkwasser for on top of its evaporation rate now. That's not something I'd recommend to everyone out there. It's obviously highly risky. You need to make sure that you're checking your salinity constantly, if not daily. I have a uh, reef factory salinity monitor on there, which does send me push notifications should it get high or low. And I also manually check my salinity every day. There are other complications though, and things like my automatic water change pump, the Kamoa X1 Pro T that is bringing that super saturated salt water into the system is super hard on the tubing. Now, despite the fact that it's going half the speed of the other pump, it does wear out much, much quicker. And I think it's just because there's that much salt in the water that it's quite a, um, it's quite a gritty solution. And um, as a result, I do have to replace the tubing on that Kamoa every couple of months, whereas the one that's taking the water out, I honestly could leave that tube in there for a year or two and it'd be no problem, but I do try to remind myself to change it out every nine months. So there's been a couple of challenges there. There's been a couple of times when I've split that tubing in the uh, salt water in pump and uh, the, the pump's not bringing the water in and I notice my salt water level dropping and um, things go a bit hectic from there. But it's been a challenge, but it's just one of those things you face. It's a, it's a pretty big system now with quite a fair bit of coral in there, getting quite a lot of coral growth. So the Kalkwasser, the calcium reactor running flat out and even a little bit of dosing has just been what it takes to keep the levels where I want them. Now, speaking of dosing, there has been another little interesting thing that's taken place of late, and I'm not sure if it's to do with the Kalkwasser or the calcium reactor, but uh, over the last six months, I noticed my calcium was dropping much faster than my other levels, which is not something I've ever experienced before. Normally, I like to keep my calcium a little bit elevated. I try to aim for about 450, 460 ppm, even 470, I'm not too stressed about, rather than the 420, 430, 440 that most people go for. I can say that in this system, I was not dosing calcium as an element. It was just taken care of by the Kalkwasser and the calcium reactor, and of course, a little bit from the automatic water changes. But my calcium just started to plummet. And when I say plummet, it got down as low as 360 ppm, which is, is really pretty low and definitely not the level I'm chasing. So I have actually taken alkalinity dosing offline and switched that out for calcium just so I can get that level back up. I'm happy to say that I'm back in the 430 to 440 ppm range now, but I am still pumping a fair bit. I'm talking an extra 50 to 60 mil of calcium a day at its maximum saturation just to gently bring that level back up again in collaboration with the Kalkwasser and the calcium reactor. But um, all in all, my parameters have been super, super steady. Uh, my alkalinity hovers around about 8.0, which is the target that I'm aiming for. Somewhere from 7.9 to 8.5 is about what I aim for in this tank. I find I get the best color. And um, as you can tell from the growth and the corals before, I'm not chasing accelerated growth. So it gives me the best results there. My calcium, I like to keep around that 460 ppm mark or maybe even 470. And we're close to it. We're up about the 440 mark at the moment. Magnesium, I do like to elevate a little bit as well. I like to keep that at 1350, 1450. Um, and we're right in that sweet spot at the moment. And all of my other parameters I measure through ICP every three to four months and then adjust using the, uh, the Reef Moonshiners program here, which um, I know there's been a few questions about it. I thought I'd sort of covered it in another video, but um, if you guys want to see a dedicated video on the process that you follow for Reef Moonshiners from start to finish, I'm happy to do that, but uh, I just want to see if it's something that you guys are interested in. So if it is, be sure to pop in the comment section down below that you want to see that Reef Moonshiner video. The program I couldn't be happier with. It makes a lot of sense to me, and to be honest, that's the most important thing. Um, obviously, something that's economical you can afford to do is important. Um, it's not the cheapest program out there, but uh, it's definitely not the most expensive. And like I touched on, it just makes sense to me um, using their calculator, the targets we're chasing, the adjustments and the dailies you do to get to those levels. Uh, you quickly learn what your tank's consuming more of and less of, and it, 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 it just makes sense. So uh, I highly recommend if you are interested in the Reef Moonshiner program, jump on their website, have a good read through their free hand guide there, read it through a couple of times. It's a little bit like Fight Club, 
First rule of Reef Moonshine is, is to read the handbook. Second rule is to read the handbook. And third rule is to read the handbook. So read the handbook, please do. Andre will be happy to know that I'm telling people to read the handbook. Once you have done that, you can jump on their Facebook group where there's a huge support there from people using the Reef Moonshiner program all across the world. And you can ask any questions that aren't covered by the handbook there. But um, like I touched on, if it is something you want to see a go to woe video on, I'm more than happy to do it. Just pop in the comment section down below. Other than that, all of my equipment's been working really, really well. I did recently hit the 1500 test mark on my Master Tronic, which did then start to cause a little bit of inconsistency with the actuator in that, which is fair enough. I mean, it's literally sitting inside my cabinet here in the sump, and uh, the actuator is the part that moves the uh, syringes back and forth, and it needs to be super, super precise. So once I started to get a couple of little errors with that, I reached out to the, uh, the Focus Tronic support team, and they had a look into my system, had a look and said, yeah, you've done over 1500 tests which is about when we start to see that part wear out they offered to either send me the part obviously at a cost so that i could repair it myself or fantastic support offered from uh, ready up in queensland said if you prefer you can send me the unit i'll do a full refurbishment on it and uh, that was an offer i could not turn down so i have just recently got my mastertronic back from ready fully refurbished and ready to go again which is uh, super super cool and um, i might touch on some of the future plans on equipment in the next section of the video but there will be some stuff focusing around the mastertronic which should be pretty pretty cool other than that everything in here just continues to truck along the abyss pumps down there have just been bulletproof i have not serviced them once in putting them into this tank so they've done three years of continuous operation without skipping a beat and continue to work flawlessly even my skimmer here the cove has been operating flawlessly if i was to have my time again i possibly would have gone sea torch just because i've used some of the other sea torch equipment and i've been really really happy with it but uh i can't say anything bad about the cove skimmer it's worked a treat i give it a super hard time i rarely rarely ever clean it which you can probably see there it does have an, a vast neck cleaner on it and the drain is plumbed into the drain so i never have to take the uh, cup off and empty it but maybe once a year i pull it apart clean the body take the pump get any little snails or any bits of algae or whatever that have got into the needle wheel there give it a clean and um it just trucks along so i can't say more about the cove it's it's really stood the test of time and uh, i do get some questions about my homali filter all the people question why it's uh, squeezing in in the middle here to be honest i don't really know i think it's just because the amount of load i put on it but uh, where the water actually passes through the mat down the bottom here it remains a full width so it does not impact performance whatsoever and i gotta say these rolls last so so long and they do such a good job of pulling all of the gunk out the rolls I get from Hamali probably last me about four to five months each roll, which is pretty long. In fact, uh, I've only bought replacement sets of rolls once in the three years. Uh, I think I picked up four or five at that time. So I got two rolls, two or three rolls when I first got the sump. I've picked up another four or five rolls and uh, we're three years in and I'm just about at the point where I need to order some more rolls. So if your filter roll is going through rolls quicker than that, maybe you want to have a look at the Hamali setups here because they last a super, super long time. Other than that, uh, I've got my refugium here. The light's currently off, but uh, it's been growing really, really well to the point where I'm actually having to dose a little bit of Coral Essentials nitrate up just because uh, my phosphate's been controlled nicely by my GFO over in the corner there, but uh, the nitrates are just getting stripped out a little bit harder than I'd like. So just having to put a little bit of nitrate in just to keep the balance there. But um, it likes to hover around about one, sometimes one and a half. So I like to just try and keep it there. If I don't dose the nitrate up, I am getting down to about zero to a 0 0.25, which considering it's a full mixed reef is not where I want to be. I think that's about all I wanted to share with you on the equipment updates, but if there is anything in particular you'd like to see more information on, again, please don't be shy. Put your questions in the comment section down below and I will either respond to you there or I will go out and make a dedicated video just for that topic if we get enough interest in it. So um, yeah, please don't be shy. All right, onto the final update of the Dream Reef Tank at the three year mark and that is section four, which is future plans for the tank now. <laughs> As I touched on, I definitely do not plan on turning this thing upside down every other week because uh, things are growing quite well. And apart from some of those niggles I had with fish, things have generally been an absolute pleasure to deal with. And um, we went through all of the equipment down there and uh, I really haven't had any problems with anything other than growing pains, I guess, from the tank, which is not a problem at all. It's quite a joy to deal with. So 
What would I want to change on the Dream Reef tank? Well, we talked about fish earlier on. I definitely do want to add some more fish to this system. Uh, I have had a look at maybe adding a uh, red stripe candy hog just because it's a fish that I did have many years ago in my previous tank here and um, a fish that I really enjoyed and did unfortunately make the fatal mistake of adding a second hog fish, which I uh, didn't like him and uh, cost me the loss of the original red candy stripe uh, uh, hogfish. So once I saw those starting to become available on collector's lists, again, it's something that um, I am mm, testing the waters of whether I add a uh, red striped candy hog to this tank. Other than that, I would love to try another blotchy Anthea. We had Barb living over there and um, I really did enjoy her in the system, such a beautiful fish. So I'm half tempted to try once more. I've only ever had one Borbonius Anthea, that was Barb and I've lost her. And my rule generally is if I lose two of the same fish in, you know, I'm not talking if I lost one 10 years ago, then I lose another one now that I'll never try it again. But if I lose two fish in the same sort of year, I tend to stay away from those fish because I don't like just repeating the same mistakes over and over again. So having only lost one, I'm tempted to try another Bourbonius Anthea, but um, I might see how we go with the hogfish first. I just feel like it's a little bit more of a nuggety fish that can probably hold its own if there are any sort of aggression issues. And um, we'll see how things go from there. Obviously coral is um, something that I have a slight addiction with. And um, as you can tell by the pieces sitting down here waiting for me to find new homes for them in the tank, I will always be adding more coral to the tank, let's be honest. So I am running a little bit low on real estate. I have added some things um, on the back wall and uh, continue to be a little bit creative with some of the uh, coral placement. But um, I do have a couple of little openings down here thanks to uh, this coral getting, this hammer coral down here getting a little bit uh, extension happy and stinging a few other pieces near it. So I've got room for a couple of nice little hammers as they come in. I've always got room for SBS. Um, I'm not afraid to mount SBS on top of SBS and uh, just see how things work out. Particularly here in Australia where we have access to such incredible and affordable wild SPS that you just never know what the growth pattern or color is going to be like. It's, um, it's, it's like a lucky dip and it's part of this hobby that I truly, truly enjoy. And uh, thankfully for me, my good friend David Deer Park Aquarium continues to get ridiculous wild SPS in at a fraction of the price that anywhere else has. So I'm always going to end up picking up an SPS colony here or there, even if it's just a little frag of a colony that uh, someone else has picked up. And I'll continue to find spots to mount those. But I think Probably the biggest updates for this tank in the future will be a couple of minor little tweaks to some of the equipment. I have long talked about my Orphec light bars and how I'm not the biggest fan of them. I don't feel they give a huge spread, huge penetration, huge par. They do give a little bit of color. Um, I feel like what they mostly do is chew power and produce heat. Now, <laughs> I could be harsh on that. I know people out there love their Orphex, but for me, I just, they've never quite uh, gelled with me. But uh, after spending the money I did spend on them, I wasn't in a hurry to throw them in the bin. So they have got to the three year mark on my tank. But um, after seeing just how well the AI blades work whilst working at Deer Park Aquarium, I am super, super tempted to put some AI blades, basically take these four Orphex OR390 bars off and put in four of the AI blades in their place. So running them front to back on the tank. Whether that's a good idea or not, I don't know. We've touched on the uh, coral growth, health and color that I've got in the system. So changing lights again is probably not the best idea, but um, anyone that's followed this channel for a while knows just how much I love playing with lights on reef tanks. So having uh, something that's fully controllable up there would be pretty cool in replacement of just the on off Orphex. And um, having seen the results they give at the Park Aquarium over their coral holding systems there, I'm super confident that they will be a good addition to this tank. So once I save up a few bickies, it might be something that I do lash out on. Unless of course, AI, if you're watching, you wanna reach out and uh, sponsor that change, I wouldn't say no, but otherwise it's something that will happen eventually. I've just gotta save up the money and um, bite the bullet at some point in time, pull these all fix off and put the AI blades up and see how things go. Now, one other change that I have pretty much spent the money on, I'm just waiting to get the time to put it on, is to uh, either replace or add the dosing on this system with some uh, Focustronic Dosetronic systems. I actually have a uh, Dosetronic, the full-blown one, which is capable of doing continuous dosing, as well as their Dosetronic DC, which has exactly the same footprint. Basically is exactly the same unit, but is not capable of doing continuous dosing. I've got one of each of those units that I am planning to add on here and will consider doing some of my uh, Reef Moonshiner doses through that system. I have long spoke about how I do enjoy doing those daily 
daily doses myself as a manual task because it is something that does sort of connect me with the reef tank. But um, just when I have been recently out and about and flying around this country and doing things with both the YouTube channel and also work, knowing that uh, those daily dosages are still happening would just be something that would be pretty handy. Plus, I am pretty tempted to see where the Mastertronic Essential, their new smart tester, where that goes in the future. What uh, We don't know many of the specs of this Mastertronic Essential, but um, I would like to maybe hook up some of their doses to that system and allow it to do a little bit more automation. So. I um, basically have those two dosing pumps there ready to go. They're five channels each, so uh, it does give me the ability to dose 10 uh, parameters or, uh, or liquids, I guess, into the system. So it's something that I definitely want to look into in the future, but um, I am just waiting to see what that Mastertronic Essential does before I decide to bite the bullet on it. Because whilst I love the original Mastertronic as much as I do, I'm not 100% ready yet to let it automate dosages of things like um, iodine or iron, um, calcium and alkalinity and magnesium, sure, no problem, uh, phosphate or nitrate, even if you wanted to then dose some of that nitrate from uh, Coral Essentials that I'm currently manually dosing. Yeah, I'd have enough faith in the system doing that, but those really obscure elements here like I touched on iodine and iron I think I'll continue to manually dose those so we'll just see what the Mastertronic Essential is like and we'll go from there I am still playing with the uh, Reef Factory smart tester and I've got to say I've been blown away with how incredible it is um, I will hopefully have the magnesium reagent for that soon which I've got to say is not something I'm as g'd up about the uh, phosphate test was something that I was super super keen and I've been super impressed with just how accurate it is and um, like I touched on if I need needed to dose phosphate in this system, it would be something I would actually have the confidence with on the uh, Smart Reef system to then do so. But uh, the magnesium, I, I'm happy just dosing that at a set amount each day. I don't need to vary that from uh, the tests. But uh, that's probably the equipment side of things that I'll look at changing on this tank in the future. We touched on the fish, the coral, that's the equipment. That's probably all the changes I'm gonna make. Everything else around the system is working exactly the way I planned it. and. Um, I'm pleased with that because as you know, if you've watched this channel for a while, I put a lot of effort into planning this tank. So um, to see it get to the three year mark, which I've got to say my previous display, once it got to about the two year mark, it, the coral did start to grow quite quickly, but I had also at that point discovered things that uh, I didn't like about the tank and the setup and I would change if I could do it again, where I'm at the three year mark and there's really not much, if anything, I would change on this system other than what I have touched on before is giving myself access to more electrical outlets just because um, whenever I do go and add any of those new bits of equipment to this tank, I have to then run power leads and stuff and it's it's a more difficult task than it should be. But um, other than that, every single thing on this system has gone perfectly to plan, apart from the fish loss and stuff. But from a logistics perspective, it's been, it's been an absolute dream. So it's super fitting for it to be my dream reef tank. All right, guys, I should probably wrap the video up there because if you haven't noticed, I am starting to ramble a little bit. I do just want to say if you have any questions whatsoever, whether it's just a quick one-liner question or whether it's something you want to see an entire video dedicated to, please do not be shy. Put in the comment section down below. I do reply to each and every comment there. So it is the best way to get hold of me if you have a quick question or if you have something much more in-depth you want covered. Please don't be shy. Put the comments in there. And last but not least, I do just want to quickly say that I know you guys love the tank tours that I do, and I am pleased to say that I have now lined up a few more tank tours over the next couple of months, so you will see plenty more people's reef tanks other than just mine, of course, and store tours. I love getting out and seeing your reef tanks. I've got a few lined up, but I would always love to see more. So if you are in Australia, ideally in Victoria, but anywhere in Australia, I'm interested in coming and seeing your reef tank. I want to put you on YouTube and I want to basically document your tank where it is now. So you've got that to always look back on. And um, I'm also just keen to meet you and see how you go about your reefing because every single tank tour I do, I learn at least one new thing that I can do to improve my own reef keeping. And that's probably the best thing about this hobby is that there is no shortage of things to learn and continually improve on. Other than that, guys, I will leave it at that. Thank you so much for watching and being part of this journey over the last three years. It is truly humbling to have so many people watch these videos, subscribe and comment. I never thought as a, uh, I don't know, just a fairly jovial Aussie guy with his reef tank that this many people would follow on my journey. So thank you very, very much. I really do appreciate it. And uh, other than that, guys, till next time, stay safe and keep reefing. Cheers, bye.